Hello, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and my guest today is Marquita Poole Eckert. She began her career as a producer over 40 years ago at WABC-TV. In 1990, she became the senior producer of Sunday Morning, making her like a giant you know, before anybody else in the world, black woman in a senior production position at CBS News. Uh, she's a, an Emmy award-winning storyteller, recipient of multiple awards, including the Chuck Stone Lifetime Achievement Award she recently received at the National Association of Black Journalists. Uh, congratulations on that. I was so excited to see you being honored for a truly wonderful career in television, network television news. Well, thank you, Carol. And um, I was excited, too. And I must say, it's really a pleasure to uh, be talking with you now because we've known each other for so many years and we've never really done this. Right, and right. so, um, yeah, I was looking forward to it. And I was really surprised when I received uh, that award because I thought, really? <laughs> 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 Why me? Why now? Because there's so many things that have happened since I first started in television. Things that now were inconceivable then. Uh, and uh, so which just shows you, you know, step by step, baby steps, which is kind of what I feel that we did. Uh, but I know you say we've known each other for a long time. We graduated the same year from Boston University, 1966. Yes, and you never <laughs> interviewed me then. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> I know, 19... So we've known each other for a spell, and I followed yeah. your career. You were always a hero uh, to all of us because you were sitting in the room where there truly was no access generally to anybody else, you know, mm -hmm. and you were calling, calling the shots, you know, out in the field, around the world, you know, so many stories. Talk to us a little bit about how that began for you and the, how you were able to sustain a career as long as you did. No, that's a mystery. That's an answer. I probably don't have an answer to that one. But uh, I will say that uh, it's just, it was a combination of being prepared and being in the right place at the right time and having the right people decide that they're going to take a chance on you, which at that time really was taking a chance because when I first, uh, you know, it, here's what's interesting to me. Back in the day, uh, when we started, there were not that many of us actually in television. And so, um, you, I, after I graduated from Columbia, I told some people, you know, I really want to work in television. At the time, I was working at Time Life, uh, and, uh, which was fine, but not enough. And so you, I called people, and then people called me, and they said, you know, there's a job over at uh, WABC uh, TV, they're looking for a producer. Uh, maybe, you know, why don't you call the executive producer and, uh, you know, see what he says. Mm -hmm. So um, I did, and uh, I got the job. And um, it's just interesting because then when I went to CBS uh, later, uh, years, some years later, someone uh, called me and uh, said, you know, they're looking for, <laughs> right. you know, right, uh, right. A, uh, a black woman specifically, really, you know, to uh, to be a producer at uh, at CBS News. And so uh, you were recommended, and uh, so you're probably going to get a phone call. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the fact that I had already learned a lot at Columbia Journalism School and really I have to give them really mm -hmm. credit because they had a great you know television program and um, I studied under Fred Friendly and uh, ah, you know right. so it was sort of known at the time that if you went to Columbia you you could get hired uh, and that you know I must say really worked for me what was interesting was they were very nervous about hiring me for CBS uh, News. I was actually associate producer, and it, they were very nervous about that. They CBS. Mm. It was a bigger deal for them, I guess, mm -hmm. than it was for me in some respects, because they weren't really sure, could you handle this? I mean, this is going to be difficult. There are going to be people who think uh, that you're not up to it. They're going to doubt you from the beginning. I mean, this is what I had a private conversation with someone who was sort of, I liken that person now to kind of like a screener. <laughs> 
sure, you know, sure. that really talked to me first before right. the job was offered. I wish that the conversations were totally different now, but you know, I have a They're feeling. They're not, but I, let me just say this. Yeah. Years later, uh, the executive producer of what's now CBS Mornings is a black woman. That, I mean, right. that was, in, and I don't really even know her. I mean, which is, so two kind of two things. Two things. <laughs> right. Astonishing Maybe things. is it that now so many, and it's so y usual? I mean, of course, right. when she was appointed, it was a big deal. First black woman. And, yeah. and the same thing at MSNBC and, you know, and now Kristen Welker, who just went to yeah. meet the press, took over that seat. I mean, it was inconceivable, really. So I don't know. So I have to say the culture has shifted and the, has changed. Happily. The culture has shifted, but I think we're still, what we have, what we seem to have is these very high level positions that then give the impression that what is happening is that that kind of uh, progress is filtering through the news industry. And I don't think that's true. Well, I, I will say this. Um, another friend of mine, uh, Kim Godwin, ABC News, right. who was also at CBS at one time. And she reminds me that, uh, and this, I'm aging myself, but then again, uh, she came to CBS, uh, I think she was either a student or she was, I don't know, looking for a job and that. And she spent the day with me, she says, and she shadowed me and followed me around and everything. And it was from then that she actually knew that that was the thing that she wanted to do. And That's now look great. where she is. I mean, I know, I know, knew? I know. And, and you do that for so many uh, interns and students who are coming through, you know, that would see you and would know that whatever you were doing, they needed to do the same thing in order to move up the, the ladder. Apparently. I mean, I wasn't aware of it, honestly, all the time. I just was just doing what I... Just knew. doing what you did. I mean, traveling all over the world. Talk to us about the... I mean, you were, in a sense, a war producer. Well... A couple of times, but not. <laughs> I, you I, know, you uh, were in the thick of things in Beirut and er everywhere else. So talk. Well, I don't say every, not everywhere else, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> but I did want. What I understood was, you see, I didn't have a lot of mentors at that time. You know, I didn't have a lot of mentors, but I had people who, uh, for whatever reasons of their own, decided to take chances on me because they thought. You know, I could do it. Uh, and I wanted to, I realized, I looked at, and I saw how people advanced through the ranks. And one of the ways was, uh, you know, producing these foreign assignments. And so uh, I raised my hand and said that I wanted to go somewhere. You know. Is that what you said? I'd like to go somewhere. And well, then 16 countries later, you know, yeah, around I mean, the you world. Know, that's you're... basically what happened. I mean, I, I said I wanted to go somewhere. And I think really what happened was is that um, it was coming up on the holidays and there weren't a lot of takers for people who wanted to go to Beirut, um, <laughs> especially right after the bombing. Right, I you can know? imagine. And so um, they said, well, okay, <laughs> you right. could go to Beirut. I thought... Okay, that isn't really what I <laughs> had in mind, but I didn't. You thought maybe Paris would be nice. You know, I did, London, right? I yeah, did. but, but I talked to my uh, yeah, and I thought it, about it, and I talked to my uh, family and friends and everything, and uh, it was like, no, you you have to say yes to this, and I wanted to, but I needed to kind of that extra push, and so I did, not knowing what to expect. It was really learning on the job, because at that time, like now, you know, they have training for uh, correspondents and producers to go overseas, especially to war zones, stuff like that. We didn't really have that. Mm -hmm. And so um, you went there not knowing, you know, and very reliant on your crew and, uh, you know, the bureau fixer and who who really knew the lay of the land. And, uh, and then, you know, you you kind of took it from there and you had to know what to do. And that uh, you had to earn the confidence of the people you were working with in terms of... Life and death, right? Just, so yeah. In, in and addition it, to reporting the news in, a, in an appropriate way. Yeah. So uh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is, but this is part of Marquita's success was very matter of fact. I, you know, I did it. You know, they, yeah. they asked me to do it and I did it. And then you come back to the States and then you slide into this position of power, CBS Sunday morning. Well, before that, I will say the other story that uh, the other place that I went, which was really 
um, I went to uh, Sudan, mm. and I went there several times. And the first time I went there was, um, it, it was, you know, we got these mm. tapes in New York uh, from um, the, uh, the London Bureau. They had gotten them from this guy who's a Kenyan cameraman who sort of covered Africa. His name was Mohammed Amin. And he, uh, you know, was covering what turned what turned out to be this incredible famine. So someone handed me tapes and they said, well, you know, uh, take a look and see what's there. And, I, you know, my, I couldn't believe my, what I saw. There's nobody really knew what was on these tapes and there were, you know, pictures of all these dying people, uh, you know, walking across the desert. I mean, it was pretty uh, hair raising. I must say, and so that was when it was decided that this was a story. I said, "This is a, we have to." You decided, we can't just, right? You well, told I recommended, you know, based on they asked me to look at the date and see right. what was there. Right. And I said, "This is something, you know, we haven't really been paying attention to. It's an incredibly important story. It's a big, a huge part of the population of the world, and uh, and this is what's happening, and people need to know." So. You know, uh, but so I, crucial that you were the eyes that looked at the tape and decided that this was important because I just was recently, we were talking with Rachel Swarns, who was a part of a lifting up all of the stories that got buried about black people, for instance, in the New York Times and mm -hmm. that they were now bringing them back. And here was an instance where you, as a black woman, looked at this and said, I don't care if no one else is doing this. This has got to be covered. It's a news story. Well, you know... I always, that, you know, I talked about this when I got the award at NABJ, about how the first time I actually uh, understood the power of television news was when I began to really watch the uh, civil rights demonstrations on yeah. television. And um, it was astonishing to see, and people... Uh, those are the dogs, uh, the dogs in Birmingham, the hoses. Right, the ho yes. right, right. And that's where you got the award, which I thought was wonderful, back in Birmingham, right? Well, where the convention was. That was, yeah. And and so I saw those that, and I said, you know, this is something uh, people have to really see and know, and I want to just be a part of, you know, telling that story and be, being sure that people know. So that's when I, I kind of knew back then that I wanted to find a way to be in television. I didn't know how that was all going to happen, but it, you know, again, it did. <laughs> it, it did, yeah. It did. And I must say, when I went to Birmingham, I thought, Birmingham? You know, in an abstract sense, I knew about Birmingham. But, I mean, I have to give full-throated shout-outs to the people in Alabama in both Birmingham and Montgomery for what they have done to really center and focus the role of uh, well the people of Birmingham and Montgomery in the civil rights movement I mean I didn't really I knew it in an abstract sense but I didn't really fully feel the impact of it until I went there this time and so to have that be it, it did sort of come full circle, actually. Right. And he wrote me a, a, lo a lovely note because, you know, that's where, you know, where I'm from and where my relatives are, you know, in various phases uh, active in that movement. And the A.G. Gaston Motel, which is part of the civil rights monument that President Obama created, which is a linchpin, you know, of, uh, of, all, of, of, of all of that. Uh, stepping back to the Sudan, when you saw the famine of that, Sudan is back in the news now, a murderous uh, yeah. part of the continent, just outrageous things that are happening. And they were starting to happen when, when I was there. I mean, mm -hmm. mysterious things would just happen. You know, it, it just, um, it's an interesting kind of a place. Uh, and you wonder, um, you have to get permission, you had to get permissions to go certain places and mm -hmm. uh, people never <laughs> never understood why I as the woman, you know. We'd right, get, even the, uh, I mean, especially that a woman. Yeah, you know, it made no in, sense. In a country like that where, there, you know, there was virtually then and now it seems, you know, because of what's going on is rape is a, it's an instrument of war there. Um, but, um, but it worked for us because they would talk to the men, the men would, 
you know, who's actually, I had this great camera, camera crew. This is like critical. They were called the Greeks. They spoke five languages. They traveled all over the world. They, they knew what to do. And they would talk to, you know, whoever it was that we had to get permission to go to these places. And they'd say, okay, just a minute. And they'd come back and I'd be sitting there. Right. And they'd talk to me. The and, boss. The yeah, boss. And, and I would say, you know, yes or no. Okay, let's do this, <laughs> let's do this and thing. And then people were like, what? You know, it was kind of uh, very unusual, I guess, for them to see that. And, um, and, and then in many ways that worked for us. But as a woman, you had to really, really be aware and mind your P's and Q's and really understand what was happening. Because um, you had to be careful. I mean, there were certain things you had to observe always. You know, you had to be covered. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to really watch who was watching you. Uh, because and because uh, I remember one night uh, we went uh, to a market uh, and near the Red Sea and um, it was an incredibly beautiful night market and uh, the guys went I don't know to the pharmacy or something and I was out looking at spices and and all that and all of a sudden I realized that you know people were looking at me. And I was, and I didn't know where my guys were. And um, so I sort of slowly made my way back to where I thought they were. And uh, because these people were, you know, they were curious. I'm not saying right, they had right. any. They were massing around you, right? Yeah, you know? I'm not saying sure. they had any malintent right, at right. all. I have no but, idea. But it, I was just a curiosity. And they... And I, my guy suddenly sort of came out of the mm -hmm. uh, store where they were, and I casually strolled <laughs> I know. over. And, you know, we all sure. kind of left together. But, like, I realized, no, I, sh I shouldn't be alone. Right. Uh, so there are things you learn. You just pick up things. You just have to be aware. And I would say that uh, that's how I made most of my career, just by being observant and being aware. And you learn things, and you see what people do, and you understand, you know. Yeah, how the, how the how system work. works and what you need to do to protect yourself. And yeah. that's the, so back on, on stateside when you began, you know, as the senior producer of the Sunday morning show, which was like, you know, historic, iconic mm -hmm. uh, television, what, what was that like? Because you were, you were really, in those days when there were fewer cable networks and social media and all of that, CBS, NBC, and ABC were it in terms of sources of news. So you were really shaping the, the knowledge and the opinion base of much of America. The audience for that show it was incredible. I would say, you know, I started watching Sunday morning uh, some many years, actually, before I ever really worked there. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody called me up and said, do you, on Sunday morning, look at the, do you ever watch it? Look at this show. Right. And from then on, I watched it every Sunday morning, even before I As most there. of America did, yes. As it turned out, it, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, most uh, of America, you were producing the show that most of America was watching on Sunday morning. And it's, a, you know, it's interesting because um, even though we have all these different uh, ways of communication mm. now, uh, sometimes a good idea sustains. And Sunday morning is one of those good ideas. And that show, no, no one has really tried to emulate it exactly. There right, are yes. variations of it and, and things. But no one, no other networks have actually, if they've tried to emulate it, they haven't been successful. I mean, well, it's iconic still. And sure, it but it's just, because it's not, um, you know, 20 second stories. It's a. Uh, Thoughtful, yeah. extensive, you know, uh, where where you really can pay attention if you'd like to, and you really can't learn something. I think it was originally conceived as kind of an antidote to the news as we knew it, because at that time Walter Cronkite was delivering the news. It was hard news, no fluff, no nothing. I remember there was a whole discussion about whether or not to, how to announce. The death of Elvis Presley because mm. he was a rock and roll singer, and so, mm. right, you know, you know, and right. so it's and so Sunday morning became 
it was sort of meant to be an antidote. And you could tell that because, you know, they had nature and everything, which now seems to be more relevant than ever. Climate, sure. Yeah, sure, climate. climate. I mean, and so, like I said, it was a brilliant idea. And, you know, CBS has had the uh, good judgment to... Um, to continue to, it, to, right? To continue it, you know. Right, but I don't think that I don't think that many people realize that calling the shots on a show imp as important as that was uh, this black woman who had, you know, worked her way, you know, up the the news industry, and that she was really defining uh, what what it was uh, what was important to know about the profiles that, you know, you did there. Well, again, you know, the chance that I got was due to the person who was the executive producer at the time, you know, and uh, she decided that, you know, to take a chance and that I could do it. And I will say my entire career, I have always sought opportunities to tell our story. I mean, that was, like I said, the reason I got into it in the first place, the opportunities to tell our stories. And so whenever those opportunities arose, um, yeah, I was an advocate for that, unabashedly, and, uh, you know, I was an advocate for that because I figured, well, you know, there are plenty of other stories being told, but people don't really know that much about us. So right. that was an opportunity. So what do you think, what do you think of uh, news today? I mean, that I'm, I'm sure you get, you get asked that all the time. I think. The, yeah, the, the industry as it exists now with hundreds, thousands of ways to get your information now uh, and a, in a country that is solidly divided. Um, and I think it's solidly divided because for better or worse, there are all these assorted sources, siloed sources of information. Um, the word news, you know, generic now, uh, certainly conflated with opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and opinion, you know, it started out that when people had talk shows, it was a really, well, early on, Face the Nation, Meet the Press, those were sort of considered uh, shows that, well, I, I remember hearing the term setting the agenda, you know, for what Americans should be thinking about. So covering Congress, what was going on in Washington, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, then, uh, over time, so those were early talk shows. And um, if I'm not mistaken, some of them were under the public affairs right. uh, rubric, right. which meant that they didn't have a big budget. So the inexpensive way is to do the same thing they do now, invite people who cover Congress, cover the Supreme Court, cover, you know, to be on your show and talk about what they've learned on their beat. Win-win. Uh, inexpensive for the broadcast and great publicity for the reporters and writers uh, uh, of print and digital who might not otherwise have the exposure. Uh, and so everyone, you know, wins at that. So, uh, but it also, uh, everybody figured, oh, well, we can do that too. Mm. And so now uh, you get opinions almost as much as straight reporting and straight reporting is almost fighting for you know so so do you ascribe to the theory that some have is that the reason that we are such a divided country is because of the news quote news media that the media create this lock jam that we have i think uh the uh information that people uh, are the information that is sort of being offered to people, uh, people have all kinds of opportunities to pick the thing that they want to hear, uh, not necessarily the thing that they should hear, which was, again, Walter right. Cronkite's, this is what, and interestingly enough, remember he was considered the most trusted man in right. America, and he was the one who decided this is what people need to <laughs> right. know. Right. Now, people decide what they need or want to know. And as a result, they're not necessarily exposed to other things that they should know, Con uh, other information, contrary views. Um, no, they just go for what it is that they think they want to hear. It's validating, you know, their already entrenched views. Uh, and so the opportunity to actually 
uh, come to some kind of uh, agreement on something and move forward is becoming increasingly difficult because people don't want to hear it. Yeah. And so I, w I wouldn't blame that on the news, per se, whatever we're considering news. Right. But, you know, yeah, if you're um, of a certain political persuasion, you listen to uh, or you watch MSNBC or you watch Fox. Never the twain shall, shall ever be. meet. <laughs> so you don't <laughs> right. hear the same information. And so you form your own opinions based on, you know, this information that you get. Right. So and, as a, as a long time, anything. yeah, as a long time observer, though, of knowing how this works, of what people hear and the actions that they make, how are you optimistic, pessimistic about where we are now in terms of our, you know, democracy of holding on to, to I'm hopeful that uh, people will uh, understand what it is that they have in common. And uh, also, I think history is becoming more and more of a, I'm very interested in history now. And I see it having more of a place in news coverage. I'll just say one thing. Right. This morning I heard something on NPR. Uh, one of the reporters went to, um, Ellis Island. He, this was in response to uh, Mayor Adams' comment about how the immigrants coming to, mm -hmm. he, he actually said he was misquoted. He didn't say the immigrants coming to New York City was going to ruin New York City, but the inability for uh, New York City to actually take care of them and treat them in the way that, you know, uh, and New York is the only city that that guarantees, that guarantees shelter for people. It's a, it's a the only city in the country well, he, yeah, that well, guarantees he, shelter. To he, well, he may, someone, I, I don't know, again, yeah. I wasn't, he uh, apparently, that the hundred, that the migrants who've come in the past month were over 100,000, were more right. than at any other time. Turns out not so. Um, he, he said in the past year we've had more uh, come to New York than uh, at any other time. And it turns out not so. This reporter went to Ellis Island and looked and said, you know what, in one month, 106,000 immigrants came through Ellis Island in one month at one time. So apparently uh, the city, you know, was able to work it out. Right, right, <laughs> right, so, right. And so it's all, Marquita, you, you'll, you'll have to come back because, I mean, you're just a font of experience and, and information and knowledge, and we want to thank you, congratulate you on your Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you. Which was quite an achievement to have uh, been a central part in the leadership of the news uh, business, as we used to, uh, to call, call it. Thank you so much for being with us today. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I'm really very proud of that recognition, I have to say, and I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very well deserved. And thank you all so much for being with us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and we will see you the next time.